Good evening. My name is Eugene Hahn, and I'm this year's chairman of the VIP Distinguished Speaker Series. This program is one of many put by the Undergraduate Business Council. Today, we are joined by Dean Eric Hurst, Senior Associate Dean of Undergraduate Programs at the McComb School of Business, and Lance Fritz, Chairman and CEO of Union Pacific Railroad. We will begin tonight with a conversation between Dean Hurst and Mr. Fritz. Then we will open the floor to the Q&A from the audience. Lance M. Fritz is the Union Pacific Chairman, President, and Chief Executive Officer. He became Chairman of the Board effective October 1st, 2015, and received his bachelor's degree from Bucknell University in Mechanical Engineering and his master's degree in Management at Northwestern University. Prior to joining Union Pacific, Mr. Fritz served in various executive positions with Fiskars Inc., Cooper Industries, and General Electric. Fritz is deeply involved with organizations in his local community. He serves on the board of directors for Nebraska Medicine, Omaha Symphony, and Omaha's Henry Dorley Zoo and Aquarium. Fritz serves as chairman of the board of directors for the Association of American Railroads, and he is also a member of the board of directors for the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, a member of the STRATCOM Consultation Committee, and a member of the Georgia Institute of Technology President's Advisory Board. Now that you have all heard a little bit about our guest speaker, let's get started. As a reminder, today's event will end promptly at 6.30 p.m., and we would greatly appreciate it if you could refrain from, from leaving early and from using electronic devices. Well, without further ado, please help me welcome Dean Hurst and Mr. Fritz. Well, thank you very much for being here. We've had a chance to talk a little bit beforehand, mm -hmm. and I'm looking forward to our time together. Likewise, and, thank you, Eric. Uh, I've, got some, I've got a hardball to start with. Good. All right. Tell us about your first job. Ah. <laughs> and uh, maybe segue in to how you got into railroads. Yes. Well, that's a pretty distant journey, and I'm going to shrink it for you. Um, after undergrad, it was mentioned I got a mechanical engineering degree. I started with General Electric. And at GE, they um, organized annually a couple of different management training programs. Mm -hmm. There was one for technical sales, one for financial management. I joined the one that was uh, around uh, manufacturing management. And that uh, attracted me because uh, it, was, it was formal. Uh, it was about the shop floor. Uh, I, was, I, I really liked that. I liked making things. I liked the, the, uh, the kind of assembly side of mechanical engineering as opposed to the design side. And my first job was in a plant in Syracuse, New York that built sonar and radar for the US military and uh, it was being a production planner for a radar manufacturing line. And so what that meant is every day, I had to make sure that the production line had the material and, and the individuals necessary, the labor, to produce whatever was scheduled for that day or the portion of the schedule for that day. So that was, that was the start of my career. And then how I got to the railroad was, um, after working for GE for about four years, I went to business school at Northwestern and then I went to work for Cooper Industries and did a number of things. The reason why I did that was to exercise some uh, financial skills that I picked up at business school. And at some point, uh, a division that I was the chief of marketing for got sold to a competitor. And I just really disliked my experience with that competitor. <laughs> right? They were an arch competitor. and. Um, it, I, I chose to leave that company after just a handful of months, went to Fiskars. And at Fiskars, I was using a recruiter to find a general manager that worked for me. And when that assignment was complete, he started recruiting me into Union Pacific. And that's how I got here. So it wasn't through GE and the railroad business at GE? It just, no, sir. It just happened. It just happened. We, we talked about that with students this, uh, this afternoon right. about uh, career paths tend to be wanders more than they are you know, linear. Right, right. Now, I know you watch House of Cards. I do. Game of Thrones. I do. Hell on Wheels? <laughs> Some. Yeah, now, that's not true, right? When you see that show, that's, that's, a, uh, that's an enhanced version of history. It's not today's railroad, anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was important that I got that one out there. <laughs> so, what, what, what does UP do that's different than its competitors? How would you, how would you differentiate UP and yeah. what makes it successful? I mean, this is, this is a hundred billion dollar company. Yeah. Right, in market cap? Yes, we are. We're a Fortune 120, $100 billion market cap uh, company. 
Uh, we're the most profitable uh, railroad in the United States amongst our class one peers. And what makes us different, uh, I'll break that into a couple of different pieces. In part, it's about how we were made by our predecessors, by my predecessors. Uh, we're an accumulation of a number of very large uh, railroads, the Union Pacific, the Southern Pacific, the Missouri Pacific, uh, others. And in crafting that as one network, as the Union Pacific of today, we have a franchise that's like no other. Uh, we serve all the fastest growing regions of the western two-thirds of the United States. Uh, we enjoy a, a greater exposure to industry than our closest competitor in terms of size and geography. And it's just a unique franchise. It's really, it sets us up uh, for success. And then we build on that uh, by having a unique perspective on uh, how we go about conducting our business. So the first thing we do is um, we're a very mission-driven organization. And because we're so tightly woven into the U.S. economy and the global economy, uh, we perceive our vision as building America. And our team can really get into that it, because when you show up for work, uh, regardless of what you're doing for us, whether it's running a train or driving a spike or dreaming up a new business development opportunity, whatever it is, uh, you can have direct connectivity to a piece of the economy that matters and matters a lot. Whether it's clean water, whether it's the food we eat, the cars we drive, the clothing we wear, the uh, electronics we enjoy, all of that's on a railroad at some point. So we truly build America and Union Pacific embraces that and builds on that. And then the other thing that makes us unique is uh, we perceive this as we're building enterprise value uh, our four key stakeholders are equally important to us and we spend resources, time, and attention on all four. So our shareholders demand an excellent return for their capital. Our customers demand that we help them win in their marketplace. Our employees demand that we fulfill them. And the communities that we serve demand that we build their economic and social fabric. And in our boardroom, literally, uh, we don't set everybody aside but the shareholder we talk about all four all the time, and we think we can build value with all four all the time. So can you give me some examples of how you're building with the communities you're involved with? Absolutely. Uh, we were just in uh, California. Uh, my public uh, relations team and I uh, went out and visited about uh, six different communities over the course of a couple of days and hosted an opportunity for the local elected officials, think mayors, city council members, Chamber of Commerce uh, representatives, local regulators. They learned a little bit about us as a railroad over a period of time, and we learned a little bit about them uh, and their needs. And so, for instance, you know, we might invest in a school or in a particular project in order to advance a specific agenda that a community has uh, so that they can, they can grow trust and respect and confidence in us because at some point we're probably going to want to invest capital in the area mm -hmm. and we'd like a community that uh, understands and appreciates why we want to do that and helps. So you talked about America, Union Pacific and America, but you talked a lot, you, you, you mentioned international trade. Mm -hmm. How does international trade, and that's maybe, we've talked a little bit about NAFTA in the other room. Yeah. Tell us about how NAFTA and international trade more broadly affects a business that's got sort of railroad on the ground in only one country. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, we are quintessentially an American company. We were created by Abraham Lincoln on July 1st in 1862. We're 155 years old. Uh, he created us to create a transcontinental railroad to stitch the United States, uh, the Union, back together after the Civil War. And, and in today's world, we're considered a harbinger of the U.S. industrial economy. We're a we're a front runner economically. But 40% of our revenue is generated in a move that starts or ends outside the United States. 10% uh, of our revenue is generated in trade to and from Mexico. So Mexico and NAFTA and international trade is critically important to us and we understand it intimately. The impact is um, us in being involved in, in different supply chains that matter to places like Texas. I've got mm -hmm. the best example. So in your audience, I'm sure somebody has uh, tasted a Corona beer or a Modelo beer or maybe a Victoria beer. S some are, are, are waiting a little while until <laughs> they do that. 
<laughs> but Maybe others a <laughs> little bit. I'm not talking about today. I'm talking in life. Yeah, but, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. maybe that's today too. I think it's probably a safe bet. Though. <laughs> There's one plant in North America in the world that produces the Corona and Modelo beer for the United States. It's just south of Eagle Pass, Texas, in a town called Nava. Uh, we accept about 150 bucks car loads of beer a day from that plant to distribute in the United okay. States. Now, here's a cool fact for you and your students to use in their in their party conversations. One box car load of beer supports a six pack a day for 47 years. We ship 150 of that a day. We also- I wouldn't have guessed that. Yeah, no, <laughs> not many people do. Once it's consumed, right, then you put it out for recycling in a great town like Austin, gets crushed. We ship scrap glass to a bottle plant here in Texas. All right. That bottle plant makes Corona beer bottles. We ship those Corona beer bottles down to the Nava Brewery and the cycle starts over again. That is a very common supply chain between the United States industry and Mexican industry. I could, I could give you a story all day long in any number of industries that are just like that. That's why NAFTA is important in the United States. It, it supports our standard of living. Right. It supports 15 million jobs. It's critically important to our engine and their engine. NAFTA is particularly important to Texas. And well, we've heard mm -hmm. lots of political rhetoric about NAFTA, expand it, shut it down, whatnot. What's kind of interesting is the, the Republicans in Texas, say, whoa, hold back on that. Yeah. Hold that thought before we close this down. How do you like doing business in Texas? How is Texas compared to, say, some other state, <laughs> a coastal state? <laughs> <laughs> we love Texas. Uh, you know, we have a big footprint here. We're the largest railroad uh, servicer in the, in, the, in the great state of Texas. We employ about 8,000 of our 42,500 people here, right here in this state. Uh, we invest hundreds of millions of dollars a year in your state. Uh, and your state's very friendly to do business with. When you're a corporation, when you're a, uh, an entity that's uh, in the industrial economy, you care about states that when they make regulations or when they're thinking about uh, uh, attracting business, They've got the lens of how is this making me more competitive as a state both uh, versus co states I'm competing with, but even more importantly on the global stage. Uh, and your state does a tremendous job of that. Your elected officials do a tremendous job of using that lens, not as their only lens, and maybe not even as their primary lens, but it's an important one. Uh, because they understand that your standard of living mm -hmm. is predicated on being globally competitive. And if you retard that too long, uh, you'll end up uh, like some other states, maybe on our West Coast, who are attracting business and people because they're naturally beautiful, uh, but that are slowly but surely creating an environment where they are not economically sustainable because they can't compete globally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So over the last year or so, mm -hmm. there's been a lot of talk about, about regulation and changing regulation, loosening regulation, and mm -hmm. this is sort of a hot button issue in a lot of areas. How is that playing out with Union Pacific? Yeah, Union Pacific is a regulated entity, right? We have a, a primary safety regulator in the Federal Railroad Administration and an economic regulator in the Surface Transportation Board. They don't set rates, but if uh, lack of competition can be proven by one of our customers, they do set rate caps. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we're, regulation is quite real to us. When we think about uh, our impact on the communities that we serve, we serve 7,300 communities. Uh, we are citizens of those communities. I have employees that live in New Braunfels, that live in Austin, that live south of you in San Antonio, that live all over this mm -hmm. great state. They care about what you and the other citizens of this community care about. Excellent education system, clean water, clean air, safe. Right? They, they want to be able to thrive in their community. So when we're working with communities, we come at it from that angle. We, we understand them to a certain degree because we are them. Our employees live, eat, and breathe there. Um, so you know, regulation uh, from that perspective takes on a little bit different uh, tent. Uh, we actively engage uh, on things that will make the regulatory environment more sensible. Uh, not, we don't, we don't actively engage on trying to deconstruct the environment. 
right? Okay. So what that means is we look for ways to allow technology to uh, achieve performance-related regulation uh, uh, targets and thresholds. Uh, we look for opportunities to use waivers. Uh, if we can prove that we've got a different way of doing things that can achieve the same outcome, uh, we'd love our government entities to allow us to use waivers to test it, mm -hmm. look at it with us, and then use fact-based analysis to figure out is that a better way to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. It, it's shocking uh, uh, without that kind of exposure, with the kind of exposure my company and I have, to, to uh, realize how little that happens in government. Government mm -hmm. very much more frequently comes up with a really smart idea in a conference room, sets it in stone, and it's outdated in five years, but it's almost impossible to get it changed. So it's a, cha it's, it's a challenge getting regulators to innovate, but yeah. you want to innovate. You're a 155-year-old company. Tell me about innovation yeah. at UP, Techno how the role technology plays, how things are different from back in hell on wheels yeah. days. Yeah. So, uh, so <laughs> when we're building that enterprise value, we, we're constantly building on six what we call value tracks for those four stakeholders. One of them is innovation. And when we think about innovation, we think about it as a spectrum of innovation from, you know, little i, one individual contributor uh, using UP Way tools, that's kind of lean operating principles, to make their work safer, uh, more reliable, more efficient, with a better mm -hmm. outcome mm -hmm. every day. All the way up to um, a significant technology investment. So let me give you some examples of the cooler, kind of more significant side. Um, you might not realize that every foot of railroad is inspected uh, at least every week, and much of it's inspected more like maybe every half week. And some of that inspection is done with ultrasound imaging that looks deep inside the steel for a defect before it turns into a failure. Uh, we have uh, 22 cars that are outfitted with that, and all they do all day long is perform those kinds of inspections to the point where we do 100,000, 120,000 miles a year of that. Um, we also use uh, LIDAR and infrared imaging and high-speed digital cameras and audio uh, detection at a thing called a portal, so it's like an erector set around the railroad, mm -hmm. and a train runs through at 60 miles an hour, and we take 50,000 images a second, and we amalgamate that into a 3D image of every car on that train. And we've got a database of previous 3D images, and we compare the one we just took to the database. And if anything's changed, it's highlighted, and that image is sent to the next train station where that train will terminate. And it allows our carmen, the people that repair cars, to instead of spending time inspecting the car, they go right to the defect and repair the car. That all happens in about two minutes. We're a world leader in that kind of technology. We're using drones. We have to inspect bridges. We inspect our bridges five times more frequently than your highway system inspects its bridges. And when we inspect those bridges, we use, in some cases, a drone. And we've got drones that are serialized to a bridge so that the operator launches the drone, hits the program, and the drone goes through an automated inspection routine to cover all that we need to see in that bridge. Plus, that's digitally archived now. So every time we inspect the bridge, we can see what's going and serialize it, same way we do with cars. So we, we, we are knee deep in technology. That is, that is fascinating. Mm -hmm. my, I, I mentioned to my wife that I was going to be speaking with you, uh -huh. and she reminded me that many years ago she used to work for the Canadian Pacific Railway. Really? And she said um, one of their biggest problems is they didn't know where their cars were. Yeah. You know whether a car is in good shape or not. We know where Presumably they are and what you know kind where of shape they all they are. are. Absolutely. So, um, can you talk about infrastructure? There's, that's another sort of big topic that's been on the the, the national agenda. Mm -hmm. About our, it's usually prefaced with our crumbling infrastructure. Yeah. How does that play out? With yeah. Well, you? I bristle a little bit uh, when when I hear people talking about the nation's infrastructure and painting a dire picture. Uh, clearly we need to up our investment mm -hmm. so that in a decade or two or three, uh, we aren't a third world infrastructure uh, nation. Uh, but in your nation's freight railroads, 
for instance, in the most recent study uh, done by the Association of Civil Engineers, uh, they grade us a B and maybe even a B plus. And the reason why we're a B or a B plus is we've got a fair number of kind of underfunded uh, short lines or commuter lines that are dragging down the nation's freight railroads, which are closer more like to an A. Uh, they grade our nation's highway system as a D. Right. right. So the freight rail network in the United States is unique to the world, and it's a unique competitive ad advantage for us. We ship in the United States a f ton of freight uh, more cost effectively than any country that you, that you can think of, China inclusive. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's because we've been at it a long time, and we've invested in it a long time, and we're getting pretty darn good at it. These are things to be proud of. Absolutely. So maybe t if you talk to me about, talk to us about how um, Hurricane Harvey oh. affected UP mm -hmm. in Houston. Yeah. We start, Eric, with the personal impact, right? So we have UP employees who lost everything. Uh, and the, probably the thing I'm most proud of in our reaction to Hurricane Harvey is the human reaction, which is uh, the operating team very rapidly uh, coming to grips with how they contact every single employee and verify their personal state and verify what their needs are and start uh, Ken Kuamara, who works for us and he's in the back of the room, uh, personally took it on himself to make sure that every single one of those cust uh, employees were connected to the agents that could help them. Plus, we run a thing called Friend to Friend, which is um, a 501c3 mm -hmm. internal to the Union Pacific, where Union Pacific employees can donate money every month that the only purpose is to go help uh, other employees. Uh, a typical month for us would be to collect and donate something like sixty or $70,000 a month. Uh, in the month that Harvey occurred, that number was closer to $200,000. Wow. And, you know, there's constant fundraising right now to keep those coffers full so that we can continue to help our employees. So that's the, f that's, that's the paramount concern is are, are, are we okay as a family? Once we work through that and concurrent with it, we are excellent at recovery, at physical recovery. So the operating team, uh, they had something like 1,750 miles out of service the day three of the hurricane. In 10 days, that was down to something like 50 to 70 miles. And in another 10 days, it was zero. We had everything back. And this includes things like a 200-foot bridge getting washed out. I mean, disappeared mm -hmm. and needing to repair major segments of something like that. We're just really, really skilled at, uh, at disaster recovery, unfortunately, because it happens right. to a railroad. Right, right. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about you. Huh? <laughs> Could you <laughs> sure. tell, tell us about your, your leadership style mm -hmm. and the challenges of being a leader of a $100 billion company? Yeah. So, so we won't turn the mic over to my team. <laughs> <laughs> We're not doing a 360, <laughs> not now. <laughs> so I, I get to tell you what I believe. Um, what I care most about are uh, culture, uh, consistency of culture, I'm very competitive, so I care about performance and winning, and that's one of our core values. So, you know, our, we, we talk about our values being a passion for performance, which is winning, uh, high ethical standards, which means doing it the right way, and team building. We do everything as a team. And that pretty much mirrors kind of, you know, how I look at the world. Uh, fellowship is really important to me. So as a management team, we do more things collegially in decision making than I think your students and uh, the attendees here would imagine. Um, so that, that, that informs how I like to lead our team. I, I view it as leading. I view it as helping set agenda. There are very rare circumstances where I'll be very directive about the agenda. There are exceptionally rare circumstances where I'll be directive about the solution or the countermeasure or how we're going about it. I'm, I'm far more interested in, you know, making sure my team has what they need, empowered. Sometimes that gets sloppy. I'm also a deep believer in diversity. And uh, I'll just share a couple of reasons why. One is personal experience. Uh, in my personal experience, a team that has different worldviews and different perspectives comes up with better outcomes. 
uh, and part of it is uh, empirical. Uh, there are studies now that show that uh, teams that are in the top quartile of their industry from a diversity perspective mm -hmm. uh, have a 15% greater chance of outperforming industry standard financial metrics, and those in the bottom quartile have a 35% greater chance of underperforming. Uh, there's also a bunch of studies from a behavioral economics, a, a, a kind of social behavioral perspective that say when you have a diverse team, the reason why it works is that when you're approaching the team with your concept, you work harder at making sure it makes sense because you know it's going to be challenged. Mm -hmm. And likewise, you listen harder to somebody else's perspective because you want to understand it so that you can challenge it. And the end game of all that is ideas are vetted better and you get to a, a better overall solution. We, I, I totally uh, believe that. I'm, I'm very happy to hear you say that. <laughs> this is, it echoes, we don't, I don't think, I don't think we have hit nirvana yet in terms I don't of think diversity related issues. Mm -hmm. But these are conversations that the leadership of the McComb School mm -hmm. has every single day. Same here. And we just keep pushing on it and pushing on it and pushing on it. And we see, we see changes slowly but surely. Yeah, Eric, I don't, it, I don't think I don't think there's an end game to that, right? No. Because what's acceptable to us today won't be acceptable to us ten years from now. Right. Um, so it's it's from my perspective, it's a never-ending journey. In our experience, we had to be really deliberate about it early, and. Uh, we actually crafted through the help of a, of a team uh, that spent some time studying it and worrying about it, we crafted a set of habits that we all committed as in, uh, department heads that we would do, 12 habits. And some of them are just kind of no-brainers, right? This is 12 or 15 years old. But they were things like, anytime we interview somebody, we're going to do it in a panel style, and it's going to be a diverse panel. All right. And anytime we fill a job, uh, the job pool is going to have fully qualified, diverse candidates in it, or else we don't fill the job. It doesn't mean that's the candidate you pick, right. but it means it's a candidate you could pick, and they'd be perfectly suited to the work. All the way to if you've got somebody who just joined your team, uh, you go out of your way to spend personal time with them, to know them and understand them and understand their skills and strengths. Uh, to, as a department leader, you're going to be personally involved in your community and the diverse aspect of your community. It's going to be a personal commitment that you make with your, with your time. Yeah, it's yeah. got to be deliberate. Mm -hmm. Our audience, other than the, well, most of the front row, there's a few, are, are starting their careers. What's the future hold? If, if, if you were tooling up today, yeah. For the world of, and we spoke a little while, like it's hard to think about 20 years from now, five year chunks, but mm -hmm. what sort of skill sets, what's, the, what's, what's going to be different? How would, how would one prepare? How would you counsel yeah. the folks in this room to prepare Eric, there for that are, world? There are some things that I think are ever present. Um, so to all of you in the room, I'd say make sure you know how to socialize and you're emotionally intelligent. And that's fundamental things like you have self awareness and you have empathy, and somebody else feels something, you know how that is to feel that, or at least you practice trying to know that. Um, so those, I view emotional intelligence, the ability to socialize, uh, that's always important, and it's as important as it's ever been. I also think global uh, worldview is really important. You, you're gonna have a much greater opportunity than I did at your age to uh, develop that. My children have developed that in a number of different ways. I would encourage you to do that. Make sure you get outside the United States and experience the world. Uh, you're gonna be able to do that in jobs. Your parents are gonna hate it that I'm telling you to get a job outside of wherever they live. Uh, but uh, I think that'll be very important to you uh, over time. I also think you're gonna have to be much more versant than I was uh, in the technology of the day. Um, you know, you'll hear some people say you, you're gonna have to know how to code. I don't know about that. You better understand what code is. You better understand what architecting is. You better understand what um, kind of statistical analysis and algorithmic thinking is. You don't have to be STEM in any way, but you need to be versant in STEM, right? I do believe in a liberal arts education. I think there's plenty of work to go around for everyone. Um, 
I think you're, you know, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a big fan, candidly, of this concept of, oh, we're going to a gig economy and you're going to be an individual contractor and that's really cool and you'll have three different jobs and you'll be really happy. Uh, maybe it's because I'm a dinosaur, right? Maybe, maybe because I look at corporations and don't think they're bad. I look at corporations and think they're a collective of good people like you uh, trying to use scale to do something bigger than one good person like you can do. Uh, but I would really encourage you to be thoughtful about that, to be thoughtful about those kinds of choices. And then the last thing that I think uh, is critically important is regardless of what you do, regardless of the institution you join or the company you join or the, or the band you keep, uh, values are, are the most important thing that is reflected in who you hang out with. And I would, I would encourage you to be really, really thoughtful about who do I spend time with, both now and as you're going into your future? Because that'll, they'll rub off on you. And if they're not of your values and not of your, that doesn't mean your belief system, I'm, I'm talking core values, uh, they'll rub off on you both in a good way and a bad way. And I, I would encourage you to be really thoughtful about that. So maybe driving off of that, what can the leadership of a company do a lot of water's gone under the bridge mm -hmm. before people get hired. Mm -hmm. But how can you um, sort of instill high ethical values yeah. at a company? And, and what happens when people don't meet those, yeah. those values? So for, in our company, we train you from day one on the expectations. Uh, you're surrounded by people that have lived those expectations either for a short period of time or a long period of time. So we'll demonstrate to you what we're doing and what we're, why we're doing it. Uh, and then we'll also uh, have consequences in the organization for people who live outside the values. And it's, it's insidious little things that we really have to be consistent on. So if we, if we hold dear the fact that we build the team, that means we respect each other and trust each other. And respect and trust uh, go really deep in things like micro inequities, uh, Little things that if you're thoughtless in one day, you can have a whole team of people think, well, that's outside that value. You're right. not living that value. So we challenge ourselves to, to every day kind of expand our, our knowledge, our worldview, our perspective on what does it mean to respect each other. And as we learn, we build it into our training component. We build it into our expectation models and our performance evaluation models. What do you wish, what do you know now that you wish you had known? Wow. Let's say a like few a, years like ago. Like a world of things. <laughs> <laughs> when, when, when you were leaving Bucknell. Yeah, so, you know, uh, if I were in your shoes, um, I, I really wish I had had a little bit more thoughtfulness around uh, getting out of my comfort zone and, and when I'm uncomfortable, that's probably a right place to be at your age. Uh, your age is the age where you experiment and you grow and you thrive and you keep your options wide open. And I was, I, I was a little more conservative than that when I was there, when, when I was the age of, of your students. Um, I'd also encourage you to, to uh, I learned early on that presumptions and assumptions are the thing that get me in the most trouble. Really, really caused me heartburn and heartache. And uh, so I, 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 I wish I was able to kind of work around that through anything other than experience. Mm -hmm. And the last thing is I was, uh, I was poor at keeping in touch with my personal friendships and the, the people that mattered to me early. Because you know, you'll leave this school environment and you'll get some of you deeply engaged in whatever you're doing. I did, and I moved around a lot. And I woke up five or 10 years later, and all my buddies had stayed connected, and I had not. And I'm investing a lot of time and attention to that right now. And it feels great, and I love that. Yeah. And I just wish it hadn't taken a hiatus. That's, that's good advice. Good advice. We're going to start taking questions from the audience. And before you take the first one, though, what will it take for, the, for Austin to grab Mopac so that we can use that line <laughs> to put our light rail through, our rail through? I would guess. So, and let me rephrase the question. How do, you deal, how, does, how do you deal with the challenges where 
multiple groups want access to yeah. the very special properties you have and how do you make a decision about whether to say, well, we'll move a line. What's yeah. it going to take to move that line? Well, bear in mind, on all those decisions, we're constantly putting in this value creation for four stakeholders, and one of them is the city of Austin right. and the needs of the city of Austin. Now, overriding that is our right-of-way is really valuable. Right. It generates $20 billion in revenue, and it generates $8 billion in cash and operating income, and it's a really sweet economic engine. It generates $100 billion in e equity value. So if somebody wants to buy the Mopac from us, it's probably got a billion number attached to it. It's probably not one. <laughs> uh, if we have a, a community that wants to use that right away for an, a purpose other than generating what I just talked about, you know, that conversation gets, it's not impossible, but it gets pretty rigorous because uh, sometimes the community looks at that and goes, well, there's only a train that runs on that every now and then. Clearly, you can fit more traffic there, clearly. And of course, you're a good corporate citizen, so you know we'll pay for how much we consume of your railroad, but that can't be but 10 or 20 million bucks a year, you know, something like that. And the short answer is no. Uh, once we commit to doing something with a community, we stick to it and typically stick to it forever uh, so that it, we don't look at what runs on that railroad today. We look at what runs on it for 50 and 100 years. And there's huge economic value in the traffic that's there. And when that traffic wants to be run by a paying customer, we want to be able to run it. Uh, we don't want to have windows and curfews and things like that. Sometimes we have really big right-of-way, and we can use part of that right-of-way to satisfy the needs right. of a community like this uh, who want to try to run some passenger or commuter rail. Uh, and sometimes that works out. We've done that in many communities, and, and it's worked out fine. Uh, but, but usually that conversation takes a while to right. get both right. parties to really fundamentally understand what are the, what are the constraints and what are the feasible To appreciate the zeros involved. <laughs> <laughs> there are more zeros on the end the zeros get than kind we of had exciting. anticipated. <laughs> right, right. And that, and that long-term perspective. And mm -hmm. you know, we were talking about NAFTA, mm -hmm. and there's, this is one of the busiest stretches of I-35 yes. through, through the country due to NAFTA and MOPAC is servicing that as well. Absolutely. So we, we want to take all those that. trucks off the highway that we can. And we have vibrant product to do that. And we're successful at doing it. So. I know there are questions. <clears throat> so we've got a couple of microphones. We're turning it over to you. Cam, you're not allowed to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> He's screening them. <laughs> He's going to go find the restroom. <laughs> OK. He knows, all the, he knows where the skeletons are. <laughs> Fire away. You're wearing burnt orange, so you get to go first. All right, cool. Um, good evening, Mr. Fritz. Good My evening. My name is Richard Zoe. Uh, I'm a supply chain, sophomore supply chain major at the McComb School of Business. Um, my question for you is, uh, what do you think about the practicality of high-speed rail transportation in the United States, and mm -hmm. how would UP be involved in that? And if so, uh, how would that affect UP's business? So I'll start at the back end of your question, and I'll go to the front end. Uh, UP is involved in high-speed rail in two states. Uh, we've actually got part of our rail line in Illinois, a piece that connects Chicago to St. Louis that's part of a high-speed rail corridor. It's really higher speed rail. It's designed to go 120 miles an hour as an Amtrak product. Uh, and the way it impacts us is uh, in order for that product to uh, be introduced by Amtrak, uh, they had to invest about $1.2 billion in that segment of rail. Uh, that meant the railroad is a little bit more rub robust. It's got a little more capacity, and, and that's a good thing for us when we use it for our customer base. It also means we've got uh, trains with high priority that we also have to occupy the railroad with and not be able to serve customers. So that's a, that's a uh, kind of a significant uh, intellectual calculus we go through to figure out what makes sense and, and what doesn't. Uh, we're also uh, exposed to it in California, in which case it's not going to share our right of way. Uh, but uh, we have a memorandum of understanding with the state in terms of if they want to get close, what does that mean, and mm -hmm. how do they, how do they, uh, how are they allowed to uh, consume part of our right of way? In terms of the vision of high-speed rail in the United States, you know, let's let's be really crystal clear about all of our experience. Those of us that have it, 
uh, with high-speed rail around the world, it's all subsidized. Mm -hmm. And to some degree, it's subsidized significantly. Uh, so if the United States isn't in a position where it wants to spend billions and billions of dollars to both build it and then subsequently maintain it and run it, it really shouldn't get into it. And where high-speed rail tends to make the most sense is in pretty dense corridors, like the Northeast Corridor where a cell is running. Now that is still not self-sufficient, but it's close, and it competes with airlines. Maybe you've got a corridor here that makes sense, uh, but you've got to be really clear-eyed in terms of stepping into it from the investment required and the subsidy. Um, you know, I'll take you way back. Uh, we in the 1950s as a nation decided the highway system was going to be our primary transportation artery uh, and that we were going to use our railroads for freight. That was a decision largely made back in that time frame. In Europe, uh, they largely made the decision that their railroads were going to be used for people transportation and freight would use it periodically. Uh, as a result of those decisions, we are way more globally competitive than Europe is as a whole uh, in the industrial world and trade. Uh, good evening, Mr. Fritz. My name is Derek. Um, I am also a freshman at the McCombs School of Business. And um, I guess my question would be, so today we've heard a lot about your company and it must be really difficult to handle it, like of its size and stature. And um, a lot of being able to handle that would probably come from like your path as like, um, as someone who's a very um, outgoing person in the business world. And so my question would be, uh, could you describe a time where you failed and how that actually helped shape who you are today and how it, you like picked up traits along the way. Absolutely. Uh, I had an epic failure <laughs> when I worked for Cooper Industries. In, uh, I was in Houston, Texas, and I was about uh, a year out of business school. And, and in business school, um, I had learned you know, cash flow modeling and the CAPM methodology mm -hmm. of understanding value. Um, and I used that uh, when I joined Cooper Industries. I was part of a small group. They hired one or two uh, individuals from business schools a year to form the nucleus of their strategy department. And we were a very acquisitive company. And so what we did was we valued potential strategic acquisitions mm -hmm. and then ultimately finished them all the way through until they were uh, being absorbed by whatever division or business unit that we had or creating their own business unit. And at the time, I think I can tell you all this because it's a long time ago, uh, we were looking at a company named Purolator Filter, uh, which was owned by Tenneco, which is a really massive company mm -hmm. in Texas back in the day. And I was responsible for valuing that business, and I made a mistake. I made a $40 million valuation mistake. Uh, and it was easy enough to make, and I can rationalize it, but it was mine. And the reason why I made it is I assumed that I knew what I was talking about. <laughs> and I wasn't asking for help. So there's that lesson. Uh, and I remember clear as day, uh, when I discovered that mistake, this is where character matters. I went into my boss and I said, I've made a mistake. I think this company's worth about 40 million less than I said it was. And he was like, what are you talking about? So I took him through the logic and, and it was almost irrefutable. I'm, I'm pretty sure I did. And then he got very red-faced and excused me. <laughs> and then he went up to tell his boss, who was the CFO. Uh, and uh, ultimately, I got called up later that day to an office that included the CFO, the CEO, my boss, and the executive vice president of the business unit that it was going to be absorbed into. And I had to explain to them uh, what I did. And, and you know what happened? <clears throat> The president, the CEO, immediately started talking about how it was the controller in the business unit that was going to absorb it. It was his mistake. Because the assumption was he's the adult in the room, uh, he's the guy that knows, et cetera. And I had to interrupt him and say, I don't think that's right. He didn't do the analysis, I did. Uh, he asked me, did I understand what I was doing? Was I was in control? And, and I said, yes. And he trusted that I did. <laughs> So what I learned from that is, A, I didn't get fired. Uh, I went home and told my wife I thought I was going to be fired. Uh, but what actually happened was uh, the CEO of the company asked me to be his assistant uh, because he could trust me, right? 
And so, um, you know, there's key learning there is character <laughs> matters, own it. Uh, and it could have gone bad and I could have been fired and I would have found a job, but I would have lived with myself. I would have known it. Um, so, yeah, I would say that's probably the, one of the seminal events in my life. Okay. Hello. Um, so, Mr. Fritz, my name is Elliot Lee. I'm a sophomore mechanical engineer. And so I just wanted to ask you, um, how has being a mechanical engineer helped you? Like, what kind of skills have you developed uh, or gained from being, having that mechanical engineering background, um, especially, like, you know, uh, managing such a big company like Union Pacific? Yeah. So what, what uh, mechanical engineering background helps me from the standpoint of um, you, it's, it's a rigorous curriculum and you learn to be a pretty quick study on new topic. And so that's helped along my career where I've uh, changed from industry to industry to industry. You know, just in, f in four years at GE, I started in sonar and radar and switched to jet engines and then to ultrasound imaging devices and then CAT scanners, right? And all, you know, that rigor of mechanical engineering kind of helps you get into a new thing and, and understand the paradigm relatively quickly. Uh, it also really helps to be numerate in, industrial, in the industrial world. So income statements come pretty easy, balance sheets, uh, math, statistics, you know, so being numerate helps and, and mechanical engineering helps in that. And then in a, in a company like Cooper in, or uh, Union Pacific, where we're big and mechanical based, right? Civil engineering in the roadbed, mechanical engineering in the cars and the power. Uh, it just helps to have that as a natural affinity. You're not, you're not, I mean, it's, it's in your DNA. You kind of get it kind of automatically. I will tell you, engineering, in my, in my experience, there's a, there's a trap door to engineering. And that is engineering a lot of time teaches you to kind of use a paradigm, plug in the inputs, and get an output. And so I constantly have to fight uh, a natural inclination to ask closed-ended questions, to develop a paradigm in my own mind of whatever's going on in my business world, and then uh, not include other people in the development of that paradigm and instead devolve into closed-ended questions just so I can plug it into my model. That's a really bad place to be. Uh, good evening. My name is Basil Chima. I'm a freshman. My question is, um, how do you see the freight railroad industry in America changing in response to autonomous trucking and driverless mm. trucking? Yeah, so autonomous trucking, uh, or even platooning, uh, will be a competitive threat to us. Uh, when they take the driver, when the trucking industry takes the driver out of the cab, that fundamentally changes their cost structure and their risk profile. Um, so that, that's, a, that's a threat. On the opposite side, all the technology that's necessary to create an autonomous truck or vehicle is readily available and can create an autonomous train. And think about trains. We have many fewer degrees of freedom we have to worry about. Uh, in trucks, the degrees of freedom are you could be anywhere at any time with a lot of things coming at you. On railroad, you're on the railroad, you're very limited in where you are, uh, but the thing that'll change is the train. It's not the same every time. The locomotives are where the smarts are, but what it's pulling or carrying can be vastly different, uh, you know, day to day. Uh, so from our perspective, t uh, autonomy looks like both an opportunity and a threat, and uh, we're approaching it from the perspective of uh, being in front of it enough so that the threat doesn't hurt our business and the opportunity benefits our business. Okay, thank you. Yep. Hi, well, uh, first of all, thank you for being here. Uh, I guess my question has to do with your, you mentioned the safety measures that you use here in the States and the consideration that you must have here with uh, infrastructure within the United States. Uh, you also mentioned 10% uh, of your revenue comes from Mexico. Mm -hmm. I guess my question has to do, how do you change your business uh, development perspective when you plan to you know, operate here in the United States versus you know, crossing that border to Mexico yeah. and facing, you know, uh, you know, I guess, wars infrastructure, uh, security issues, and mm -hmm. you know, uh, I guess I would, a different context when it comes to business operations. How do you deal with that? 
Yeah, so we do not operate as a, as a company in Mexico. Our, our railroad actually ends at the bridge, uh, but we are a 26% owner of the largest railroad in Mexico, the Ferromax, the FXE. And so we, I'm on that board and I, I fully understand uh, the security issues and the operating issues that Mexico has. Mexico's railroad is, uh, is very much in an immature phase in comparison to the United States freight rail network. It's only been privatized for 20 years uh, and um, it's really had significant investment and development in those 20 years. We've been at it for 155, right? So, so there's a little bit of uh, unfair comparison in terms of where they are on their journey versus where we are. Security is a big, big issue down there. Uh, you know, their uh, army actually gets involved in securing the rail infrastructure uh, because it's so important to their economy and the local uh, policing officials uh, uh, aren't, aren't as effective as necessary. Right now there's 3,000 soldiers in the middle of the st uh, uh, Mexico whose uh, job it is is to secure and protect a segment of railroad from thieves, thievery, and, and gangs. Um, I think this. I think the the Mexican government fully understands that. They've shown a commitment to it. Um, I've met with uh, their defense secretary, General Cienfuego. Uh, he gets it. He gets that accountability and responsibility. Um, and it does impact business development, right? Uh, uh, cargo owners want uh, reliable, predictable supply chains. And they don't care if it's not your fault that that si supply chain got disrupted. They just care that it got disrupted. So I, I can assure you that the companies down there are great partners with us in development. Uh, and we're constantly thinking of ways to make sure that trains don't stop because that's when they'll get robbed and there's protection and security on routes so that they don't get uh, uh, ambushed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yep. Good evening, my name is Truv. So you mentioned several new technologies that have come about over the last few years and several changes that happened as well in the railroad industry. So what change that's happening right now do you think is the most important for the railroad industry or just industrial companies in general? I am so pleased you asked that question because it's spot on. Um, Mindshare, the, the largest by far Mindshare consumer for me right now <clears throat> is the journey that our customers have with us from the standpoint of we're a pure B2B business, business to business business, uh, but our customers are consumerizing rapidly. You know, it, in their personal lives, they use Uber, they use Trivago, they use Amazon, you know, fill in the blank, where Pricing is immediate, transparent. Uh, doing business is uh, any multitude of options when you have a demand. Uh, track and trace is immediate and comes to you in any form you want. Paying the bill is automatic. It's a credit card on file. Then when they come to a large industrial firm like us, you know, they might have to wait a day for a price. How is that? Or uh, it might take a week to set up credit. Or if you want to track and trace, you're doing it my way, not your way. That's unacceptable, right? And, and the consumerization of our, of our marketplace is the single biggest thing that's happening right now. And it's happening rapidly. And we are all over trying to figure out and actively uh, change our business model to match it. We've got at least half a dozen to a dozen pilots all along that journey uh, experimenting with things that in the course of the next now to eight months will be implemented. Hmm? I believe we've got our last question. Really? Awesome. All right, so my name's Prasanna. I'm a senior chemical engineering major. Um, you spoke at length about the importance of diversity and how you've instilled that in your managers mm -hmm. uh, through those 12 steps. And I thought that was really, they were really in interesting to listen to and exciting. Um, how does a company like Union Pacific uh, plan to uh, attract top diverse talent uh, in a company or, or in roles where, you know, maybe it's not the sexiest job to work the night shift? Uh, like, yeah. how do you guys plan to seem exciting to young people? Amen. Well, one is we are cool, right? <laughs> are we cool or what? <laughs> no. 
yeah, we're a cool place. So one is do things like this, right, to help educate people like you that we are cool. It looks like, you know, your grandfather's train going down the railroad, and it's nothing like that. The other thing is we give uh, young people huge amounts of responsibility. Christina, if you were to join us uh, in about your first year, you're probably going to be responsible for about $25 million of market. And in your second or third year, it wouldn't be unusual if you were in the sales and marketing team to be responsible for $50 million in revenue in market. If you were on our operating team, it wouldn't be unusual for you to be responsible for hundreds of millions of dollars of assets and a team that's trying to, to uh, accomplish uh, our segment of business you know, in some portion of the railroad. Um, so the way we make it cool is you know, we have or, uh, employee resource groups. The young professional one is called UP Ties. So it's where you and your buddies get together and you have kickball leagues and you, know, you, you do all kinds of crazy stuff. Scary movie night and Thai food night and whatever. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then you, uh, uh, we invest a bunch of time and attention and training in you so that you're able to do your job well uh, and feel really good about it. And we're constantly hammering the message that you build America and you see yourself building America. So your work matters, uh, which is particularly cool. Um, our work's not for everybody because you pointed it out. You know, we might have a, a night shift job for you when you first show up and it can be pretty damn lonely on the night shift in uh, New Braunfels, Texas. But you're not alone, you're never alone. and. Uh, uh, we're constantly investing in you to help you see how cool it is to work for a railroad. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, can I ask a question of the audience? Absolutely. Who wants a job? <laughs> no hands. What no, the they're, they're, There we go. All right. Now we're getting real. Well, Good. I, I want to thank you for this conversation. And I know what, what, what the thing I found most fun about it was learning more about the railway business. Yeah. And the excitement that you've got. Oh yeah. And you know, it it's a 155-year-old modern high-tech going somewhere important business. It is super cool. And can I brag? I, one other thing we've done. I mean, I, I sure. just can't stop. Sure. So for those of you that are like computer science or civil engineer or, or uh, we we've invented a, a, a moat that we can attach to the web of our rail and it'll tell us the health of the rail. And so we're anticipating, we put one of those every couple of miles and we've got all 32 and a half thousand miles of our railroad monitored all the time, telling us what its health is so that we don't have to wait for it to break. We fix it before it breaks. That's like the golden, that's like the golden chalice that everybody's been looking for. Is, we're on the cusp of doing it. <laughs> that is pretty cool. Yeah. We don't, we don't, I didn't think about that when I thought about railroads. There you go. I man. thought about missing freight cars. You thought about hell on wheels. I did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Dean Hirsch and Mr. Fritz. We appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to speak with our students today. And I know that we will be able to take your lessons, you know, about being empathetic and self-aware to become better professionals, traveling and working abroad to gain a more worldly perspective, and most importantly, uh, the importance of free trade for college students. Amen. <laughs> um, and as a token of our appreciation, the Undergraduate Business Council would like to present you, Mr. Fritz, with your very own Stetson cowboy hat in recognition of your participation Holy in the VIP cow. Speaker Series. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yes. <laughs> Look at that. Nice. I'm officially a badass. Nice. <laughs> yeah. No, hold on. Is this right? Is it? Th it's not yeah. this. That's yeah. hanging loose. Yeah. I'm sorry. Exactly. <laughs>